Welcome back to HCRI's event, Israel Palestine, where is the UN? We are joined in our second panel by Shawan Jabarin, Catherine Gallagher, and Ardi Imsis. Unfortunately, as I said <coughs> earlier, Valentina Azarova can no longer be with us here today. This panel will follow the same format as the first. The speakers will each have 15 minutes each, and then I'll put questions to them posted by you, the audience. Please put these in the Q&A box. Our first speaker is Shalan Jabarin, who is the General Director of Al Haq, the Palestinian human rights organization based in Ramallah, and Secretary General of the International Federation for Human Rights. He also serves on the Human Rights Watch's Middle East Advisory Board and as a commissioner for the International Commission of Jurists. Jabarin was the first Palestinian to be recognized by Amnesty International as a prisoner of conscience after having spent years under administrative detention in Israeli jails without charge or trial. He is a recipient of the Reebok Human Rights Award in 1990 for his defense of freedom of expression and human rights. Our second speaker is Catherine Gallagher, who is senior staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York City. She's an expert on universal jurisdiction and international criminal law. Prior to working at the CCR, Gallagher worked at the United Nations International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia from 2001 to 2006, and as a legal advisor for the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in Kosovo. She also served with the Special Court for Sierra Leone in free time. She has written widely on the issue of Palestine and the International Criminal Court. Our final speaker of the day is Ardi Imsis, who is Assistant Professor of Law at Queen's University, Canada. He's author of The United Nations and the Question of Palestine, Rule of Law and the Structure of International Legal Subalternity, which is soon to be published by Cambridge University Press. Before joining Queen's, Imsis had a 12-year career as a UN official in the Middle East, first with the United Nations Relief and Work, Works Agency for Palestinian Re Refugees in the Near East, also known by its acronym UNRWA, and then with the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Now this panel will last uh, one hour and 45 minutes. We will end at 4.45 p.m. British summer time. Shawan will um, probably have to leave us um, maybe 10 minutes earlier. He is He's on another webinar, he's a very busy man, about the history of Al Haq, which is a very important topic that he's speaking about. And please write your questions in the QA function box, box and I will gather them to put to the panelists. Thank you for your participation to the speakers and the audience, and I'll pass over to the panelists and ask Shawan to, to begin proceedings with his remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mandy, for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, it's an honor uh, to be part of such distinguished panel. Where is the UN? This is a question that has become harder and harder to answer for the Palestinian people still seeking the realization of their right to self-determination. When Al Haq was established in 1979, the International Bill of Human Rights had recently come into force, providing a source of optimism for the direction of humanity into the future, not just for Palestinians, but all peoples of the world. The harsh reality is that despite the grand words on paper in the UN Charter, the International Bill of Human Rights or the Geneva Conventions, the process of translating those words into actions continues to, to be stuck in the global power dynamics, which shaped the creation of the UN in the first place. Despite the numerous resolutions from the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council and even the Security Council and many commissions of inquiry, the political will necessary to put the interests of all the humanity ahead of national self-interests continues to be lacking, leaving the Palestinian people trapped as pawns in an imperial game of chess. 
the political and the economic interests of powerful states continue to dominate the direction of humanity into a dangerous future. The lessons of World, <coughs> Second World War were supposed to provide future generations with a reference point to what happens when the benefits to some must come at the expense of others. Despite the fact that the question of Palestine has been on the table of the UN throughout its existence, the international community has continued to fail in solving the question in a just and equitable manner. Not because it cannot solve it, rather because it's unwilling to exert the necessary energy to do so. The failure of the international community to solve the Palestinian question has allowed the new form of colonialism to emerge that threatens to undermine the gain made in the historical process of decolonization. It's no coincidence that this year marks the start of the fourth international decade for the eradication of colonialism. With only three states voting against the initiative, US, UK, and Israel, how can we expect to eradicate colonialism when it's allowed to continue in Palestine at the, expense, <laughs> at the expense of the Palestinian people and the realization of their right to self-determination. Despite all of these challenges, we continue to believe that the UN can be what we think it should be. That is why we continue to engage it and the new mechanisms that have developed within it. The COVID-19 pandemic has reminded us how interconnected we are in the world and the importance of a healthy functioning system of cooperation. The injustices facing the Palestinian people are microsome of global injustices and the global injustices require collective actions. It's the states that have been entrusted with their respective social contracts that bear the primary responsibility for taking a global actions regarding humanity's collective problems, whether they be contemporary colonialism, a global inequality, poverty, or a climate change. Respect for international humanitarian law is no exception. Israel's exploitation of the lack of willingness by the third state parties to hold it accountable has not only allowed to it, uh, it to act with impunity, but also emboldened to go further. The impunity that Israel continues to enjoy sends a message to states with imperial ambitions that might make right. And history has shown us that imperial appetites are rarely ever satisfied. Champions of the rule of law based system must counter this message, not only for the question of Palestine, but for the international system as a whole. Leaving Palestine as an exception to the universality of the right to self-determination, it threatens to swallow the rule. Its responsibility of the international community, especially the high contract party to the Geneva Conventions, acting through the UN mechanisms to make the coast of Israel imperial ambitions and colonial practices outweigh the benefits it continues to enjoy. Maintaining the, annu the annual update of the UN database on business involvement in settlements is an important step in this regard that must continue. The next test on the question of Palestine will be the ICC and how the international community deals with continuing crimes facing the Palestinian people on a daily basis. Now, more than ever, I believe that history will judge how the international community deals with the questions of Palestine in the near future as either the point where the rule of law based system was preserved or where it began to unravel. Now, is the time for action. Thank you.
Thank you, Shoan, um, for that very important uh, first commentary. I'll pass straight on to, to Catherine Gallagher, um, who will take these ideas forward, particularly as regards the ICC. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Mandy. Um, and it, it really is a privilege to be on this panel and speak with uh, Artie and, and Shawan. Um, so thank you for the invitation. I am going to be speaking um, about the International Criminal Court. And I should mention at the top, I am a legal representative for victims in the current situation before the ICC. Um, I represent victims in a submission made last year, um, victims of the crime against humanity of persecution. So represent Palestinians from all parts of, uh, of Palestine uh, physically, and as well as the diaspora. Um, so that is, is my opening. Um, we have seen some pretty big steps taken at the International Criminal Court in the last year. And as Raji Sarani said in, in panel one, the train has left the station. Um, there is now an ongoing investigation at the ICC into um, at least war crimes and crimes against humanity that have taken place on the territory of uh, Palestine, including the West Bank, uh, including East Jerusalem and Gaza, um, or by Palestinian citizens. This jurisdiction of the ICC over this territory was confirmed in a historic decision uh, issued in February by the pretrial chamber that recognized the self-determination of Palestinians and the state of Palestine to accede to the Rome Statute. So this is a, a big step forward. Um, the prosecutor announced the opening of an investigation in March. Again, a big step forward. But my um, comments today will be that the record of the ICC is a bit more of a mixed bag for Palestinian victims. Um, there are indeed signs of hope, um, but they have been long in coming. And frankly, the ICC as a holistic institution and as an idea um, captured by the international community back in the 1990s when the Rome Statute was enacted and brought forward with 122 member states, um, the ICC itself, I would argue, has not yet fully embraced the ideas that the uh, preamble put forward of a equal access to justice and a true commitment to um, ending impunity. Indeed, the preamble speaks about the fact that grave crimes threaten the peace and security and well being of the world. It, lays out that serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole must not go un unpunished, that the effective prosecution must be ensured by taking member measures at the national level. And in bringing forward the ICC, there has been a determination to put an end to impunity for the perpetrators of these crimes and to contribute to the prevention of these crimes. The Rome Statute came into effect in 2002. And when one looks at the situation of Palestine since that time, um, we have had so-called Operation Cast Lead in 2009, in which over 2,200 Palestinians were killed, 1,600 plus of whom were civilians and more than 300 children. Then in, in 20, 14, we had so-called Operation uh, Pro Protective Edge, in which case, again, there were a high number of civilians killed um, in the thousands, and there were 556 children killed. We had the Great March of Return uh, in 2018-2019. Again, the UN set up a commission of inquiry for all three of these incidents, there have been Human Rights Council commissions of inquiry. 189 uh, protesters were killed and more than 6,000 injured. And we all saw what happened um, 
last month while we have a ICC investigation open. Um, so when it comes to ending impunity and preventing the commission of the crimes, unfortunately, the ICC, even with an open investigation, has not succeeded in, in this mandate, in fulfilling its mandate. Now, one could wonder whether what happened um, in, in April and May of this year in, in Jerusalem and Gaza in particular could have been worse and could have resulted in more loss of lives. Uh, that's one way to look at it. But I, I think the fact that there were losses of lives, that there continue to be um, threats to expel Palestinians from their homes speaks to the some of the ineffectiveness of the ICC. Um, and throughout the entire period of, of um, time that Palestine has been a member of the International Criminal Court. It joined the court in January 2015. Um, there has been a blockade of Gaza. The blockade began in, in 2006 and Palestine sought to join the ICC in 2009. That, that effort was ultimately unsuccessful, um, but through this entire period of time, Two million Palestinians have been stuck largely um, in what is referred to as the largest open air prison. Their homes in the in the in the Gaza Strip. Uh, they have been denied the ability to leave Gaza. They've been denied the ability to travel to other parts of Palestine. They've been denied the ability to thus seek medical care, family reunification, um, access to educational opportunities, access to pursue their livelihoods because of this ongoing closure. Uh, the Palestinian human rights organizations put a submission into the ICC back in 2016, laying out the closure of Gaza as a crime against humanity of persecution because it results in the denial of fundamental rights. That was during the five year preliminary examination. Um, that's a long time when, as we heard in the prior panel and has been already said here, uh, the situation in Palestine is one of the best documented situations in, in, in the world. Um, between the three commissions of inquiry, between the many UN reports, it is clear that there are ongoing both war crimes and crimes against humanity in Palestine uh, since its accession to the ICC in, in 2015. But those five years, um, the the reasonable basis test to open an investigation went on and and the blockade itself has not been mentioned explicitly as being part of the investigation um, so these are are some of the points where i think a mixed bag record the length of time the scope of what might be within the investigation, the deterrent effect. Some of these are, are due to um, the, the deep care, to be generous, that one might attribute to the Office of the Prosecutor in ensuring that um, there, there is a clear factual and legal basis for moving the situation forward. Um, of course, the work of the prosecutor has been under intense external scrutiny. It was already referenced in the prior panel that once the prosecutor um, moved forward to open an investigation into the situation of Palestine, the United States under former President uh, Donald Trump um, came forward with sanctions a, against her. That was in part due to the opening of an investigation into US torture, as well as the situation of, of Palestine, both were, were mentioned. So I'm, I'm not denying that there has been external um, pressure, but five years for a preliminary examination, and now we are um, into an investigation during the time period in which Sheikh Jarrah, Silwan, um, and, and an intensive um, bombardment of Gaza have once again occurred. So part of that 
responsibility, I would say, is on the Office of the Prosecutor to move more quickly to prioritize this investigation. Um, but the Office of the Prosecutor is just one piece of the ICC. The ICC is um, the product of member states, and they operate through the Assembly of States parties. The ASP controls the budget of the ICC. Um, I think it's notable when Fatu Bensouda issued her um, announcement yesterday that she is seeking to open an investigation into the Philippines. In what may be her final press release, she ends that press release by highlighting what she calls the mitch, mis, the serious mismatch between situations where the Rome statute demands act, action by the prosecutor and the resources made available to the office. I think we as civil society, we as a human rights community, we as a global community have to ensure that the ICC Office of the Prosecutor has the resources necessary to move forward a comprehensive and, um, and accurate investigation into the situation of Palestine. As a representative of victims, victims of persecution who have been denied their fundamental rights um, in myriad ways, it is imperative that this investigation proceed quickly and efficiently um, and that those member states provide the resources necessary. Uh, the prosecutor went on to reiterate her call for broader strategic and operational reflection on the needs of the institution and what it is in, intended to achieve. In short, an honest reflection on our collective responsibility under the Rome Statute to advance the fight against impunity for atrocity crimes. The victims of these egregious crimes deserve nothing less. And so the budget is one place where I would say the international community through the member states of the Assembly of States parties need to step up. The other is going back to that point I, I made in the preamble where states have to take measures at the national level. Um, it is clearly documented um, by commissions of inquiry in proceedings before Israeli courts by scholars and academics who've looked at this, that Israeli courts will not and will were not built to provide justice for Palestinians. And Palestinian courts themselves are not able to provide um, justice when it comes to Israeli perpetrators. So it, Palestinians have looked for the last decade plus to national courts in other countries under the principle of universal jurisdiction. With 123 member states of the ICC, they are all mandated to put uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide in their domestic codes. Likewise, the near universal uh, ratification of the Geneva Conventions require states to put the grave breaches, the war crimes provisions in their domestic codes. But when um, Palestinians turned to national courts in other countries under the principle of universal jurisdiction, they were thwarted. So this again exposes that there is a significant gap between law and justice. Um, countries are willing to put lip service forward, but when it comes to actually providing justice, whether at the ICC, they're unwilling to financially back it up or even politically back it up, and then nationally, again, unwilling to do so. Um, I would also point out that when the question of opening an investigation into the situation of Palestine came before the pretrial chamber, um, in 2020, 2020, so this is when the prosecutor after that five-year preliminary examination determined that there is indeed a basis in both fact and law for opening an investigation into Palestine. She sought clarification from the pretrial chamber about the territorial jurisdiction of Palestine. 
And she put forward that the territorial jurisdiction of Palestine includes the West Bank and East Jerusalem and Gaza um, in accordance with UN um, General Assembly and Security Council resolutions um, and, and international practice writ large. Uh, the pretrial chamber ultimately one year later affirmed that that is, is the jurisdiction. But notably, uh, a number of member states came in against the state of Palestine and against recognizing the ICC's jurisdiction over this territory. Those countries included Germany, Australia, Brazil, Uganda, Hungary, the Czech Republic, um, which is a really disturbing concept. Uh, and, and political reality. And I use the word political there intentionally because these are countries that back when the Rome Statute was adopted in 1998, embraced the idea, idea of international justice, international accountability, equal access to justice, and an end of impunity for all. And here, They've made calls over the last 20 years for universal application of the ICC principles. They've called on all countries to sign up for and support and join the ICC. And then when Palestinian civil society and the state of Palestine come forward to ask and really demand that the ICC provide this last court, this court of last resort um, for victims of, of of egregious crimes, Palestinian victims of egregious crimes, um, these countries say no. So it's, um, again, this is part of why I say the legacy of the ICC thus far when it comes to providing access to justice for Palestinians and an end to impunity by those who bear the greatest responsibility for crimes on the territory of Palestine. And um, unquestionably, I think when one looks at the historical record, those are Israeli perpetrators. Um, it's, it's been a mixed bag. We hope that with the opening of an investigation and hopefully um, the provision of the needed resources to move this investiga investigation forward expeditiously, uh, I will be able to give a better assessment of the ICC. Um, I do commend those within the institution, including the outgoing prosecutor who have been committed to ensuring that the highest ideals of the institution and the provisions of the Rome Statute are given effect, but um, it is an uphill battle to actually get justice for Palestinian victims and to stop the commission of war crimes on a daily basis, crimes against humanity on a, a daily basis, including the crimes of persecution and apartheid and forcible transfer. And one might soon be able to suggest with um, quite a lot of, of um, certainty, even the crime of genocide. So with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Catherine. Um, I'll move on to our, our final speaker of today, um, Ardi, if you could give us your comment. Thank you. Sure, Mandy. Thank you very much for having me. I'd like to thank you, Ruth, Sophie, and all your team for putting this together, and most particularly thank Catherine and Shawan for sharing this uh, podium with me. Um, I usually actually address uh, discrete issues of public international law as they relate to the question of Palestine. Uh, very much like, for instance, what Catherine has just discussed. But what I'd like to do today is uh, take your um, audience uh, a bit broader than that. It, it's similar to the sort of, uh, uh, if you like, spirit of what Chawen was discussing, broader political uh, issues surrounding international law and its application by the United Nations in particular to the question of Palestine. Um, so here goes. In the, in the politics of history, Howard Zinn observed that, quote, what one sees in the present may be attributable to a passing phenomenon, but if the same situation appears at various points in history, it becomes not a transitory event, but a long range condition. Following 12 years as a UN official in occupied Palestine, during which nary a minute passed where the limits of international law and UN action wasn't made bitterly clear to me, 
I retreated to the academy in the hope that with physical distance and time, I might be able to make better sense of it all. To that end, I'm presently working on a book, which you've mentioned, Mandy, uh, when you so generously introduced me, uh, under contract with Cambridge University Press, which, which examines the United Nations' management of the question of Palestine since 1947. The main claim of this book is that key legal texts and moments in the UN record demonstrate that Palestine and its pe people have historically suffered the effects of one of, of, one of Zin's long range conditions. I call this condition International Legal Subalternity, ILS for short. And today I'd like to briefly sketch out some of my observations for you that derive from, from the book and to do so in the spirit echoed already by Shawan and Suhad Bashara earlier today and others. The principal attribute of the ILS condition is that those disenfranchised by it are continually presented with the promise of a more just and equitable future through the application of international law and bolstered by the unrivaled political legitimacy of the purveyor of that promise, namely the UN. Uh, yet despite the lengths to which such groups go in reliance on this promise, its realization is perpetually kept out of reach in one form or another through the actions of the very same UN, which all too often either does not pay sufficient heed to the full array of international law's precepts or completely overlooks them in practice. What brings the ILS condition into sharp relief, at least for me, is, is the evident clash one is able to trace over time between the international rule of law with what can be described or called the international rule by law. On the one hand, the international rule of law is ostensibly based on the universal application of international law without regard to the power or station of those subject to it. Received wisdom holds it out as the governing legal principle regulating international affairs. On the other hand, the international rule by law is rooted in a cynical use, abuse, or selective application of international le uh, legal norms by hegemonic actors, usually, under a claim of democratic rights-based liberalism, but with the effect of perpetuating inequity between them, the hegemons, and their subaltern opposites, the weaker parties. By juxtaposing the international rule of law against international rule by law, one is better able to understand the nature of the ILS condition as, in my view, a fixed feature of today's international legal order, despite the varied configurations it may assume. And so I'd like now to look specifically at the question of Palestine and the ILS condition. When it comes to the UN's prolonged management of the question of Palestine, one finds a sustained expression of this condition in its beleaguered people, the people of Palestine. Contrary to the conventional wisdom that pre presents the UN as offering the only normative basis of a just and lasting peace in Palestine, there's been a continuing, though vacillating, gulf between the requirements of international law and UN action that has frustrated, rather than facilitated, that lofty end. Given that one of the core principles of the UN is to maintain international peace and security in conformity with principles of justice and international law, and there I'm quoting the UN Charter, understanding why and how the UN has maintained Palestine's ILS condition over time provides insight, not only into why the conventional view is mistaken, but just as importantly, how the UN might better perform its functions in line with its charter. To begin with, the origins of Palestine's ILS condition are not to be found, ironically so, within the UN itself. Rather, they're located in the interwar period and the institutionalization of the international rule by law through the League of Nations. More specifically, Palestine's ILS condition is rooted in British imperial secret treaty making and diplomacy between 1915 and 1947, which legally privileged in international legal terms the Zionist movement's Jewish National Home Project over the previously assured political rights of the Palestinian Arab majority. Relevant documents and moments are too detailed to cover here in depth, and I'm sure your, many of your audience will already be familiar with them. Suffice to say, they are fivefold, as follows. The Hussein McMahon correspondence, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, the Balfour Declaration, the League of Nations uh, Covenant, and the mandate itself for Palestine. Taken together, these five sites and their interaction with one another resulted in the international legal disenfranchisement of the indigenous Palestinians in favor of a self-declared European 
colonial settler movement to be imposed on Palestine come what may. The international legal order's structural Eurocentricity was most pronounced during this interwar period. Without it, the ILS condition would not have been able to so successfully be codified into the prevailing international legal order through the mandate system. In a real sense, therefore, the international rule by law of this period was both a description of what was happening to the subaltern people of Palestine at the time, as well as a prognostication of what was to come. Despite the promise of, so I'm going to shift now, despite the promise of a new global order based on the international rule of law in the immediate aftermath of World War II, the UN remained true to its international rule by law ordering framework that it had inherited. This is demonstrated through a critical analysis of General Assembly Resolution 181, purporting to partition Palestine in November 1947. Although the Assembly possessed the procedural power under international law to issue Resolution 181, it lacked the substantive power to recommend partition in violation of the prevailing law and practice on self-determination of peoples, and this is key, in Class A mandated territories. The sacred trust principles folded into the UN Charter via the League of Nations Covenant, coupled with the British satisfaction of its obligations vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish national home, which had by then been fulfilled, meant only that two courses of action were legally open to the Assembly in 1947. First, immediate independence of the whole of Mandate Palestine in line with the wishes of the majority of its inhabitants, or second, UN trusteeship. Examination of the UN record in the form of the UN Special Committee on Palestine, UNSCOP, its, its public and private meetings, as well as, as its final report, along with the General Assembly debates that followed, demonstrates that partition was not based on these international legal considerations. Rather, it was driven by hegemonic European states and their settler colonial affiliates. Despite claims to the contrary of some contemporary scholars, I, I think now John Strawson, for example, the declared goal of these states was to rectify Europe's centuries old Jewish question in the wake of the Holocaust. The failure to take seriously the rights and interests of Palestine's indigenous population was palpable. A close reading of, of the UNSCOP records revealed at least three factors that led to the, the General Assembly to disregard the liberal international legal order purportedly then said to govern in favor of overriding European interests. These, these, these three things are one, a bias in UNSCOP's composition in terms of reference. Two, its failure to sufficiently engage the Arab Higher Committee, which was the political representative of the Palestinian people at the time. And three, its contempt for principles of democratic governance. Cognitive in the sense that the partition resolution and its terms were so patently, um, uh, if you like, uh, in violation of the principle of, of majority rule, seeing as 56% of the country under the partition resolution was to go to the one third minority Jewish population, the vast majority of whom were only new settlers to the country. Um, but all of this is topped off with the cognitive dissidence displayed by UNSCOP as to the inevitability of violence befalling Palestine's indigenous people following partition. And this only exacerbated the practical consequences of the UN's faithful actions, which directly contributed to the Nakba, the fall of Palestine and the ethnic cleansing of its indigenous people in 1949. In reifying Palestine's ILS condition in the UN system, therefore, the UN plan of partition imposed in both normative and discursive legal terms, the two-state paradigm that would thereafter underpin the organization's uh, position on the question of Palestine a position that remains in place to this very day. So I'll shift further. Following the Nakba, another demonstration of the ILS condition emerged in the form of the UN's response to the Palestinian refugee problem. My research reveals three elements of the UN's treatment of the Palestinian refugee problem, which evince this. First, the different regime of protection available, made available to Palestinian refugees under international law as embodied in the, in the divergence between the United Nations Conciliation Commission for Palestine, the UNCCP, and UNRWA on the one hand, and the United Nations Commissioner for Refugees, or rather High Commissioner for Refugees, the UNHCR on the other. Uh, the second, uh, like UNSCOP before it, the failure by the UNCCP to engage the political representatives of the Palestinian refugee community through the Arab Higher Committee, 
And, and third, the continued gender discrimination and UNRWA's definition of a Palestine refugee under international law. Many of your viewers won't be aware of this. Um, I have this on personal knowledge, having worked for the agency and on this very issue. Um, but the definition of a Palestine refugee uh, under international law as expounded by, by UNRWA over years excludes the offspring of Palestine refugee women who are registered as refugees with the United Nations who might be married to non-refugee men. And this, this has discriminated on, uh, on, on a gender basis uh, against both men and women offspring of these couples, numbering now in the hundreds of thousands, possibly over a million people. Um, now, the, while explanations of these phenomena have been given, have been offered to varying degrees in the literature, for instance, we're told that bespoke refugee regimes in 1949 were de rigueur in international practice, and that the definition of a Palestine refugee must be understood in a culturally relative way vis-a-vis -vis local Arab patriarchal systems of public order, none of them appear to be justified for the UN to maintain today in 2021. Collectively, I believe they embody the continued rule by law, if you like, or by the UN in its handling of the Palestine problem. I shift further. With the decolonization era, there was hope that the Eurocentricity of the UN would be vitiated by the rise of the third world in the organization. Shawen had sort of implied this earlier, correctly, I think. To be sure, the forces of global decolonization did give rise to a partial recognition of Palestinian legal subjectivity and rights in the UN, most importantly, the right to self-determination in the occupied Palestinian territory as part of the two-state paradigm. This bolstered the conventional wisdom, of course, regarding the UN as the standard bearer of international law, the international rule of law, if you like. Yet a closer look at the UN's position on the OPT in the post-1967 era reveals another structural problem, namely the organization's humanitarian and managerial approach to the issue. Under this approach, the UN has satisfied itself merely with documenting a wide variety of discrete violations by Israel, the occupying power of international humanitarian and human rights law in the OPT, though without definitively addressing the legality of the very regime giving rise to those violations themselves. Instead, the UN has insisted on negotiations as the only means through which the occupation can be brought to an end, despite the plethora of evidence in its own record to demonstrate the prev that, that prevailing international law requires a far most, more robust and simpler response. Based on the UN record, if Israel's occupation was not uh, illegal from the start, it has become illegal over time for its violation of a number of use Kogan's norms, derogation from which is not permitted under international law. These are one, the inadmissibility of territorial conquest, two, the obligation to respect the right of self-determination of peoples, and three, the prohibition against regimes of alien subjugation, domination, and exploitation, including apartheid. As such, Israel's occupation of the OPT, as mentioned earlier by Michael Link, has become an internationally wrongful act because it is illegal, which according to the law on state responsibility is not required to be terminated except through unilateral and forthwith withdrawal by the occupying power. By making withdrawal contingent on negotiation between an occupying power that the UN record itself demonstrates has been manifestly acting in bad faith for 55 years and an occupied population held captive by it, the organization is not only violating prevailing international law and state responsibility, but it is also undermining its own stated goal of establishing peace between two sovereign states in the former mandate of Palestine. It is thereby, in my view, made the realization of Palestinian rights, repeatedly reaffirmed by it, impossible to achieve. I shift further. A more current example of Palestine's ILS condition at the UN concerns its 2011 application for membership in the organization. As the guardian of international peace and security, the principle of the universality of membership of the organization is the foundation upon which the UN suggests success logically rests. For this reason, the international rule of law governing UN admission has long been marked by a liberal, flexible, and permissive interpretation of the test for membership contained in Article 4 of the UN Charter. In contrast to this, an assessment of the UN Committee on Admissions 
consideration of Palestine's application for membership demonstrates that it was subjected to an unduly narrow, strict, and resultantly flawed application of Article 4.1 and its criteria. An examination of the contemporaneous debates of the Security Council demonstrates that the main driver of this approach was the United States, which used it, its legal authority vested in it as a permanent member of the council to block membership for political reasons, thinly veiled as sound legal ones. With no small measure of irony, this is highlighted through the juxtaposition of the broad and forgiving interpretation of the Article 4 criteria adopted by the United States in respect of Israel's admission in 1949, with its unduly strict and narrow application of the, those same criteria in Palestine's case in 2011. The result is to reveal yet again this whole episode of Palestine's membership as another example of the international rule by law frame, framework and at work rather. While the General Assembly's 2012 upgrade of Palestine's status to non-member observer state offered a counter hegemonic course to Palestine that produced a variety of gains in the way of affirming its status as a state under international law, Catherine had mentioned this earlier, the fact that full membership in the preeminent international organization of states remains elusive reveals the limitations inherent in such an approach. To put it simply, despite some limited gains, Palestine's ILS condition remains fundamentally intact. In conclusion, my research suggests that at the heart of the UN's failure to bring about a peaceful resolution of the question of Palestine in line with the international rule of law is its complicity in the reification maintenance and perpetuation of Palestine's ILS condition over time through the international rule by law. In addition, it is unclear as to whether Palestine's counter hegemonic resort to international law through the UN and other international mechanisms, including for instance, the ICC and the ICJ, will enable it to break free from this long range condition once and for all. It is a common refrain of policymakers, pundits, and academics alike to bemoan the seemingly endless cycle of violence and failed diplomatic initiatives that have characterized the UN's prolonged management of the problem as resulting from a simple lack of political will or crisis of impunity. To be sure, there is no doubt that these and other problems exist. Nevertheless, on their own, they do not provide sufficient explanation for the situation as it continues to fester at the UN now for the better part of a century. For that, my book argues that the UN's failure to resolve the question of Palestine is principally a product of the long range structural ILS condition, international legal subalternity, that inheres in the international legal and institutional order itself. Um, one last word before I conclude finally, this does not mean that there is no value in public international law or the United Nations at all. I am a firm believer in the counter hegemonic use, if you like, of international law and international institutions toward the end of justice. And so in that respect, I share many of your uh, fellow, my fellow panelists views. It's just that I, 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 I do believe that our audience and everybody who's engaged in this work in order to be effective needs to understand the limits politically of what can be prodded and pushed at any given time. And in order to do that, one necessarily needs to take account of what I've tried to address today. Thank you. Thank you, Ardi, for that really great conclusion to um, what's been a, a really interesting papers from people today. Um, I'm just uh, to remind our audience to put your questions in the chat box and I'll gather um, them together. Um, I'll just kick off with a couple that I've gathered. Um, some of them um, are related to the, the law in general and what's happening in terms of uh, attempts to prosecute, and others are related to kind of wider framing that, that both Shawan and, and Ardi have, have outlined here today. So one question has come in about, um, about the, the last 20 years of the global war on terror and how, how that has impacted on um, both Palestinians, um, but also the ability to find a solution. To the situation. So that's uh, one question that's kind of more, so I suppose, historical but also legal. The other uh, aspect, other question that came in was um, 
And this was actually mentioned um, a, by Raji in the first um, in the first panel, the UN Conference Against Racism um, in 2009. What, what do you think the possibilities are that there could be something else again like this? Do you think that the time is is changing? And I mean, Ardi, you very much kind of outlined saying that the kind of the, the decades of decolonization and the ways in which Palestine was an essential part of that debate. Do, have we seen that ship sail, that the UN can be a, a body where we can have these debates again and very vociferous debates about um, apartheid and, and racism, et cetera, like we saw in 2009. Uh, and the third question I'm gonna cluster with us is, and, and this relates directly to something that Catherine said, is um, you mentioned, Catherine, the aspect of uh, the crime of genocide possibly being um, invoked. Um, how possible do you think that that is? Is that likely to be something that comes to the uh, ICC investigation? Uh, and how, how possible might that be? We talked uh, in the first panel about the crime of apartheid being a kind of watershed. I mean, even I think the crime of genocide as, an, a, as a, a call, as a charge, would, would, be, would be quite um, uh, change-making, I think. So I'll, I'll let people um, in the order of uh, you originally speaking to reply to any or all of these. So, Shawan, if you'd like to, to take any or all of these, thank you. Thank you, Mandy. Let me go for the first one. I think uh, since the beginning, you know, since Oslo and uh, what's happened, uh, Al Haq uh, issued like a legal uh, analysis of the uh, agreement and said that uh, what's missing in that is the basic things missing in that one is no international law reference and no mention, even no one word mentioned the occupation. That's, I think it was a big thing. Since the beginning, we didn't believe that a uh, kind like this agreement will lead to any solution for the Palestinian case. And since that time, the occupation deepening, until today, three times more land confiscation, the expansion of settlements, the restrictions on Palestinians' life, the fragmentation also uh, touch every aspect of the life of Palestinians. Today, for instance, the Israelis, they can close, you know, all the cities and villages uh, in the West Bank, all of them, they can become as a prisons just the metal gates, they lock the metal gates, and that's, that's, you see metal gates now in all the entrances of the Palestinian villages and cities. That's the case. I think, why? Because the international community, mainly the Europeans and the Americans, they, they took the side of the Israelis first, and they felt that maybe it leads to some solution, but not just solution. That. And they dealt with that as a crisis management way. Today also it's the same. They are repeating, you know, they have been repeating themselves with the crisis management. And they see that the situation deteriorating. And now they reach the question of if the two-state solution is possible or not. I think what's led them to reach this uh, conclusion is the lack of action and the lack of will, political will. There is no political will. All of them, they don't need you know, more information. I'm sure that their offices, uh, their political officers, their representatives in the field, they send them great uh, reports, detailed reports about what's going on there on the ground, about facts, but there is no political will, for instance, to deal with that. And now this is raised a big question. If the international law, you know, in the minds of people, you know, not in my mind, for instance, but they ask a question if the international law is valid or not. And international law, I mean the modern one, 
now. It's a result, it's a result of the horrific things been in the Second World War. It's a lessons learned there, and they felt this is the path, for instance, to avoid a horrific atrocities happened in the Second World War. It's not a Palestinian invention. That's the case. And when they put it, I'm sure that the first people they put it, okay, they took in their account, you know, the political, their interests, something like that, but they felt that this is the way how if it's implemented, you know, they will avoid some crisis and the big crisis like that. But what's going on today is they are damaging, distracting, and even they are not giving any weight to the international law principles. And now there is a big question. Because of that, I say always, you know, Palestine is a test for all, you know, uh, items, for all articles of the international law. Take it, you know, the international humanitarian law. You can see that Palestine is an ideal test of that. But it's failed test. That's the case. And here, I think, when we speak about international law, we are not speaking about Palestine. It has to concern everybody. After the globalization, after the interrelation, all of these things, this is, the world is developing. It's taking a different shape. That's the case. The question is, do you want to build really on all of these principles and give a meaning to that? Or you go to other way of the explosion? That's the case. There are a new generation today. There is a new generation today, not just in Palestine, everywhere. We see, you know, what's going on. There is a hatred, you know, speech everywhere. Also, there is a gap when it comes to economy, when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, poverty, when it comes to all of these things. But there is, here I think Palestine, it represents, uh, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the big issue of the international law if you respect it or not. The last point is, there is two ways. There is a way of rule of law. And my colleague, uh, Roger Surani, always he likes to use rule of law or rule of jungle. And yes, that's the case. That's the case. If you don't want to take you know, the path and the way of rule of law and implement it and respect it and give the people the hope and maintain the hope in their minds that uh, peaceful ways, uh, legal ways, it works. Or the people, they will try to find their own way to protect themselves because the protection is the nature, a human things. And it's primary in life for you as a person or for collectively as a people, for instance. If you don't find a legal way, peaceful way to protect you, to protect your people, you will try to find your own ways Maybe here you make a mistake, you make a horrible things. I'm not justifying you know, things, but this is the way. We don't want just to keep uh, hesitating to touch the real and the root cause of the things. That's the root cause of the things. Because of that, I think the conflict will continue if there is no political will and everyone will pay the price of this. That's because at the end now with the global relations, we are, we are learning from each other. You know, it's not a globalization for uh, products and the economic uh, things. No, no. It's also about ways of thinking. It's about values. It's about, uh, you know, techniques. Uh, it's about everything. That's the case. Because of that, I say, this is the situation. When we call, we are not just speaking and calling for things because we are Palestinians and only cure for Palestinians. No, we are saying that this is for the humanity everywhere, for the world, that's the case. For Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, Iran, uh, Australia, for the First Nation in Canada, and for everybody. That's, you know, how we are dealing and uh, thinking. Because of that, it's failed, because of that. But today, to be honest with you, as a human rights activist, I feel that things are changing with all of this dark picture, we see also a light. We, saw, we see also a light when it comes, for instance, that the tapos regarding not touching the Zionists, not touching, touching you know, the Zionism, uh, 
or not touching, for instance, Israeli practices and, and, and all of these things. In US and elsewhere, we see that the new generation is more open. They are ready for, for a change, for addressing things the straight way. Uh, what's going on here in the field, we see that the young generation is leading now in the street in Palestine, between 15 years old to 25 years old, those they are in the street. And they are ready to fight you know, for their dignity, for their rights. This is also, and we saw also the solidarity. And we saw what's happened in London, for instance, the big march in London, you know, just to support you know, Palestinians' rights and justice. What we saw what's happened in Detroit and in different states in the United States, in Australia and everywhere. I think this is also give a message that the people, they fed up, they can't, you know, accept all of these things and they are ready to do anything to change the situation these days. And now the international law, the UN as a mechanism for the implementation, for the respect, for to, ma to maintain peace and security, I think they are facing a big question. If their presence and their existence uh, is maintaining really peace and security or not, or maybe we are now in a new era, maybe we have to think about different things. And I think the public, they can play a role. And these days what's going on outside, it's not just an internal policy. The question is, it's an external policy. It's a foreign policy. It has to become a foreign policy because it affects what's happened in Syria, affected Europe regarding, for instance, refugees and immigrants. And maybe today, if things you know, become a different way, maybe people from Gaza, they, can, they leave. You know, they leave and they may be new wave for instance, to go to Europe. That's the, uh, the case. This is because of that, we say there is an interest for everybody to maintain the rule of law and to defend you know, justice and uh, international law principles. Thank you. Thank you, Shawan. Um, Catherine, would you like to come back on, on any or of these questions? Sure, I'll um, just make a couple of quick points on the global war on terror. Um, question and then briefly address the genocide. Um, I think that I appreciate very much the question of what is the impact on the global war on terror. Um, I'm, I, I think there is one. Um, as we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of, of the September 11th um, attacks, it's it's really disheartening. Um, obviously, the the attacks themselves were uh, a har I'm from New York, uh, a a horrible day. But the aftermath globally, um, based on the U.S. response, has been felt in so many corners of the world. Um, I think there's a normative impact with the impact on the international legal system and the the rule of law rule of law for whatever it is, the international human rights institutions. Um, the US has al had always at least rhetorically uh, spoken in support of human rights and international law. And what we saw in the US response to 9-11 was um, it, the war in Afghanistan, the war of choice in, in Iraq, although Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, and we saw a global torture program. We saw domestic surveillance, we saw um, Islamophobia rise, and we saw the invocation and the proliferation of a terrorism label. And that was started by the United States and, and bled throughout the world. So we saw international human rights institutions um, degra degraded. We saw um, UN special rapporteurs when they were calling out UN torture, US torture and the US not doing anything about it and still largely enjoying um, impunity, the US officials who led that torture program. This has been a model that other countries have followed. Um, and so I think the international legal system as a whole has taken a hit. 
and that through line is there. Uh, we didn't see a, a great correction during the Obama years. And then, of course, we saw uh, the, the Trump administration again um, flouting international law regularly and giving no support to these international institutions that are supposed to protect human rights. So that, that um, degradation of the human rights and in international legal order is something that has had a, a direct impact um, on the chances of enforcing the Geneva Conventions or having any kind of accountability um, for the commission of, of crimes by Israel. I see that directly. And then that terrorism piece, uh, the, the currency of, of calling um, a human rights defender or the other a terrorist is something that has certainly um, been employed by Israel against Palestinian human rights defenders, by, uh, by Israel against human rights organizations. Um, and this is something that the US, um, I, I believe, has, has given credence to um, by pointing the finger so easily at everyone and invoking terrorism. Um, the sanctions list that Fatou Bensouda, the prosecutor of the ICC was put on is a, a sanctions list that um, is for, you'll see many foreign terrorist organizations on. Again, this proliferation of the idea of terrorist um, when there is a, a um, political difference in some cases, rather than any kind of criminal activity. So I, I do think that there is a direct impact um, here. And I'd, I'd be interested to hear um, if my colleagues on the, the panel feel similarly. Um, when it comes to genocide, and looking at the crimes that have uh, occurred and continue to occur on the territory of Palestine, uh, whether they count and, and qualify as the crime of genocide, um, I feel increasingly that answer is yes. And this is a analysis that I am working on right now and, and will put forward um, to kind of substantiate that, that conclusion I am coming to. Um, whether it, we see that prosecuted at the ICC, TBD, but uh, just to kind of remind uh, the audience what genocide is, it is a spe specific intent crime where the perpetrator intends to destroy in whole or in part a group because of who they are, their identity as a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Um, so it's, it's a crime that is driven by discrimination against a people, which is the same um, underlying concept behind the crime against humanity of persecution. So there is a close link between persecution and, and genocide. Um, it is the intent to destroy, as, as I said, in whole or in part. So one does not need to intend to destroy the entire group. And the way it the underlying acts for genocide include killing, include causing serious physical or mental harm, bodily or mental harm to the group. Um, and I would offer to the, uh, the audience to really take a close look at that mental harm impact. The mental harm of um, decades under living alongside of or under a settlement enterprise and the settler attacks, the forced displacement, the instability, what that does to a, a person and a people, um, the arbitrary arrest and detention, the insecurity that those living under the prolonged belligerent occupation live with, um, the denial of freedom of movement, the denial of family reunification. Of course, that is alongside uh, killings that occur on a, a far too regular basis. And then, as I mentioned earlier, a now 13-year blockade of Gaza with, a, um, with three military assaults during that period of time that have taken out so much of the infrastructure, the medical infrastructure, the sanitation, access to clean water. Um, those, when you look at, at, at those aspects, they get to another underlying act of genocide, which is deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life 
to bring about its physical destru destruction in whole or in part. So again, when you look at the conditions that Palestinians in Gaza in particular have been um, forced to live under, you the the question of going to genocide becomes not a, an abstract one or a radical lawyers but something that uh, requires serious consideration um, and I would also point out that the destruction in part can be a part of the the um, a, a regional part a age group, a gender group, um, when you look at some of who is being targeted, um, whether it is men, whether it is the, the very high number of children who have been killed um, and in, in the last conflicts and uh, military assaults on Gaza, it's a staggering number of children who are being killed, um, even in the quote unquote short 11 days um, military assault, 67 children were killed. These are a high number of children. You also look, have to look at maybe some of the professions who are um, attacked and, and killed. Let's not forget that the only COVID testing uh, site in Gaza was attacked, um, that a the leading Palestinian COVID uh, doctor was killed. So these are all factors that one would take into account when doing an analysis to see whether there is the intent to deliberately inflict on a group conditions of life to bring about its destruction in whole or in part. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly um, glad to see that the idea of the crime against humanity of apartheid, um, which Palestinian human rights organizations have been advancing for years, is no longer considered a, a radical idea, but is understood to be a correct legal label, as I hope is the crime against humanity of persecution. And, and I would suggest that we really do need to add genocide to that list. And part of the, the reason why that's important is because the countries that are signatories to the genocide convention, which has obligations to prevent and punish genocide, these countries are obligated to take measures um, to act, to stop a genocide, to prevent a genocide, whether it's in, attempted, whether it's incited, one does not wait until the commission of a genocide. The obligation runs when there is an attempt and the obligation on states, including Israel, including the United States is to prevent that genocide before it happens. Thank you, Catherine, for that. Um, Ardale, go to you next, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, well, I mean, my co-panelists have covered a lot, so I'll just add a little bit to it. On the first question regarding the impact of the war on terror, Certainly there's been an impact. I think Katie, if I might, Katie, um, has done very well to set that out. But I just wanted to, th the impact on the global order and international law, but also on Palestine and its, its struggle for freedom. Certainly it's there, there's no question. But I did want to just uh, urge your um, audience to take a step back as well. The global war on terror is a moment in the historical record, say over the past 20 years, just like the Cold War was and, and other moments, the decolonization period as well. Um, and of course, the Palestine question had to sort of go through those moments like the rest of the world um, uh, and its trials and tribulations. And it's important for us not to lose sight of, therefore, the impact of any one of these historical moments on the key fundamental issues that appear uh, uh, and that are relevant in the question of Palestine. The fundamental question when considering the Israel-Palestine issue is a question that has long been faced by the Zionist movement from 1882 right down to the present. How do you establish and maintain a Jewish state in a place full of non-Jews? You must deal with that problem. And as we know through history, various effort was made, um, with intent, uh, as part of circumstance, as part of a design or otherwise, uh, to deal with the indigenous people of Palestine. Initially in 1948, it was, it was to expel them. Um, since 1967, it has been to manage that demographic threat and 
and through a number of policies, whether it be uh, uh, depopulation of East Jerusalem, 14,000 since 1967, or the West Bank and Gaza Strip, 300,000 plus since 1967, or um, putting together a host, a raft of legislation uh, from dating from the 1950s onward to ensure that the Palestine refugees who were expelled uh, in, on the number of 750,000 to 900,000 persons and their descendants since are unable to return by virtue of solely the fact that they are not Jewish. Um, when you look at all of that, those facts, those fundamental features of the Palestine problem do not change um, at all by any moment in time, including the war on terror. There was some interesting stuff done though at the time uh, following September 11th, I too happened to be living in New York City on the day, about um, the Israelization of the United States. And a lot of us were able to sort of see the, if you like, the mirroring of Israel's purported fight against terrorism now projected globally through the might of the poked tiger in Washington. Um, so a lot of the similar approaches uh, taken by the United States had already been um, reified, tested, uh, performed by Israel on, on Palestinian bodies and space decades prior to the war on terror. So there's lots written on that. I won't say any more on that. That second question concerning whether or not we are now in a moment, Mandy, um, uh, sort of similar to the decolonization period where, where there can be a resurgence, if you like, of, of uh, Palestine solidarity, Palestine freedom liberation movement. I think there is a, such a moment. I think we've seen it since the last flare up in Gaza. I think Shahwan and others have mentioned this earlier. Um, you know, through the benefit of social media, uh, kids in Sheikh Jarrah and other places have been able to, 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 to jump right over the mainstream media that is long controlled, particularly in the West, uh, the narrative on Palestine, on Palestine uh, making it almost impossible to talk freely and openly about Palestine. For instance, I'm a Canadian and the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, the CBC, has a policy expressly that it will not refer to the term Palestine. The noun Palestine will not be used by the CBC in its coverage of this issue because, and I've taken it up with them at the highest levels, incidentally, at the CBC, because, quote, Palestine is not a state, or, quote, Palestine is not defined. It has no defined territory. And even though we presented the international legal arg arguments, I've written a piece on it, and it features in my book as well, as to why Palestine is indeed a state as a matter of international law, that has fallen on deaf ears. And so the social media, uh, if you like, might of social media has, has really made a huge difference. Um, and you see that certainly following the, the latest round of, of violence. I take great heart, uh, therefore, that the social media campaigns, the recognition that what Israel has now imposing on the Palestinian people in the OPT qualifies as apartheid, according to Human Rights Watch, according to Israel's own Vetselem and Yashtim, uh, their voices added to the decades of voices of Palestinians who've making that case for, you know, for the past few decades. I take great heart that we are now living in a time where university students and others are able to see through the nonsense um, of the elites, whether in the media or including at the United Nations and the diplomatic corps, and global civil society therefore has a role to play. And here I, 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 I borrow um, from Professor Falk's views. He really does have a great deal to say about the importance of global civil society in this regard um, and its importance. Mind you, there is a new hope, and we really haven't been able to flesh it out a lot in today's panels, and a glimmer of hope at one of the elite, if you like, uh, venues, the Human Rights Council. Your viewers will know that a week and a half ago, the Human Rights Council has created a new commission of inquiry to deal with Israel-Palestine. And my close reading of the mandate of that commission of inquiry and my knowledge of how commissions of inquiry work, I, I happen to sit on the UN commission of inquiry for Yemen, for instance. So I'm in tune of what's happening inside of the uh, OHCHR and the United Nations Human Rights Council on how these things operate, is that the mandate itself is unique. There has not been since 1947, a United Nations body 
mandated to examine human rights and other violations of international law, root causes, if you like, in what we would consider mandate Palestine, that is both sides of the green line, since UNSCOP in 1947. This is, this is a revolution, if you like, and the mandate of the new uh, Commission of Inquiry allows, will require the commissioners of, of inquiry to look both at the OPT and at what is happening in Israel at root causes, and that will necessarily require them at some stage or another, because it's a standing committee commission of inquiry, this will remain in place until further notice, will require them to look at structural violence committed against the Palestinian people and indeed against the Israeli people, um, but of course, primarily the Palestinian people, empirically speaking, the facts will drive it, um, including through apartheid including through the imposition of the legislation that the Israeli settler colonial state has imposed on, this, on Palestine, whether it be east or west of the Green Line, so to speak, within Israel and the OPT since 1940, 50, 1950, aimed at a number of things to divest Palestinians of their property um, and hold it in perpetuity in the name of the Jewish people through the Jewish National Fund and Israel Lands Authority uh, to, um, ensure that the Palestinian refugees, now numbering 5.7 million, if you would take UNRWA's records, uh, and even possibly larger than that by other uh, scholars who looked at the question, uh, making it impossible for them to return to that, to their homes and their property, withholding compensation for those things, imposing a regime of apartheid, colonial uh, oppression and so forth in the OPT, settling that territory, looking at the whole of the experience of the Palestinian people, both inside Mandate Palestine, Israel, the OPT, call it what you want, and outside of it. This is the import of the new Commission of Inquiry. And I don't think it is something that we need to sort of just dust off and think, well, no, it's similar to all other UN Commissions of Inquiry. No, this is potentially a paradigm shift, if you like, in the practice of the United Nations on the issue. And it comes at a timely moment when people are now openly talking in the mainstream media about apartheid being the reality in the OPT, at the very least, and possibly in, in Israel. Thank you, Ardi, for that. I've got another round of questions um, for our speakers. Um, a couple of them I relate directly to, to things that you said, and a couple are more general. One of them is directed dire uh, to you, Ardi, um, around your concept of international legal subalternity. And the question is, how much of a role do you think the ILS condition has impacted the crystallization or lack thereof of the prohibition of colonialism as a peremptory norm of general international law, leaving us to try and address the crime of colonialism through its constituent parts rather than as a whole? So that's a very specific question, but the others can please feel free to answer that too. The, uh, another kind of legally specific uh, question relates to um, asking basically if there's anything still ongoing at the, uh, the ICJ, uh, whether there's any um, cases or, or investigations uh, that are ongoing with the ICJ. And the last two questions that I'll, I'll put on here are kind of more general and possibly a bit less legal and a bit more political. One relates to the discussion that we just had, which is on the, the politics of language. And there's been quite a lot of questions that have come up in the box about the terms that are often used um, when we talk about the situation in Israel-Palestine. Some uh, participants have asked, should we use the term conflict, for example? Um, even we can all think back, it's not that long ago that it was controversial to use the concept of apartheid. I mean, even John Dugard, when he uh, relinquished his role as special rapporteur, the first thing he wrote was that he, he was unable to use that term because of the pressures on him from, uh, from international donors. And anybody who's worked in the UN and the OPT for any length of time, which uh, many of our participants have done today, know that the reports are, are, are picked through with a fine tooth comb uh, in a way that we don't see in any other context. So just the, the question relates to around the language that we use uh, when we describe it. One uh, question was about, should we use the concept conflict at all? 
Um, should we even describe um, uh, Israel uh, as a Zionist or as a, a Jewish state or how should we describe it? So just really something general on the politics of language. And the final uh, set of questions are clustered around, um, and this is the you know, $50 million question, is um, what is the, the, uh, both the obstacles and the advantages to either the one or the two state solution? And what would be the legal um, aspects that would surround uh, these both? Uh, I'll start off with Shawan. You can take any or all of these. <clears throat> Hard questions. Let me start with the uh, <clears throat> last one. And uh, here I'm speaking in my personal capacity. And as the Palestinian, how I'm looking at things and how I'm dealing with things. <clears throat> if you ask most Palestinians these days, they will speak about one state solution and one Palestine. That's in the street if you go and you speak to the people, that's how they think. I personally, for instance, I can say maybe a little bit different now. I can say <clears throat> two state, this is a personal because we are not taking a political uh, position as an organization, but as a personal, I think it's the Palestinians, they are with two state solution, with one state solution, with, they have no problem. They are looking for two main things, justice, rights, and mainly, mainly in this case, refugees, return of refugees to their lands, to their homes, that's one main thing. The second one is self-determination. And here I make connection between right of return and the exercise of self-determination. Because self-determination is for people and it's not for part of the people. And when we speak about Palestinian people, this is including the Palestinians in diaspora and everywhere. That's, and you can't say that this is half self-determination things. And I think we have to develop these things. As Al-Haq, for instance, we had a paper, it's quick paper, making like it's like, like between the self-determination and right of return. That's an issue. Another thing is <clears throat> for Palestinians, <clears throat> they look at the two-state solution, maybe this is, a way that they can build their capacity, institutions, uh, uh, growing up, you know, normally when it comes to the institution issue. And later on, maybe can both sides, they can decide about the long-term future, how it will become. That's another thing is I can't drop in my hands the criminalization of the occupation according to the international humanitarian law that we have been repeating and building on in the last 54 years. And just go for instance, like one who just fly in space without umbrella to go down slowly. If you say one state solution, what do you mean? One state solution now, for instance, the Israelis, they are controlling everything between sea and river and uh, the domination over Palestinians, uh, pushing them outside of their country, taking their land and everything. That's part of the reality. In reality, this is the case these days. Are you asking for one democratic state solution, for instance? Are you asking for one uh, Palestine state solution? That's the case. There are many different elements in this discussions. Because of that, I say, Two-state solution, one, I don't want to drop from my hands and what we built and the international community built also in the last, let me say, 54 years about the ending the occupation, criminalizing the uh, settlements and uh, uh, <coughs> transfer civilians to the occupied territory, uh, 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 
that's the applicability of uh, the humanitarian law uh, in this one, uh, because we can't live with the settlers, for instance, in one place. That's. And here, when you speak about one state solution, the Israelis, maybe they will start using it as, OK, let's deal, you know, as they dealt with Oslo, that this is for a final status, which it means why you are in hurry. What we are doing, you know, we will solve it in the future. The future, it means maybe for the next 1,000 years. This is how they are trying to use the time, you know. And here, part of the, uh, the case, I am with the two for personally speaking at this moment, but I am strategically with one democratic state solution. And I think the one democratic state solution can have the answers for all the hard questions relating to the sovereignty, resources, borders, uh, uh, refugees, and everything uh, like that. That's, you know, how I am looking at the things. But maybe the development on the ground show us different things. We don't know what will happen, you know, when it comes to the power balance, because who can give Israel a guarantee that they will stay as a superpower forever? This is a changeable thing in history when it comes to force and power. And I think the Israelis, they have a short vision. They haven't a long-term strategic vision in my point of view. Because Palestinians, they will not disappear first. And you can't build your existence and the presence for the long-term future on one main element called force, force and power and just follow their statements after what happened in May. You didn't hear or you read from any of the officials or key figures anything about, let me say, solutions or political solutions. Nothing like that. They say to maintain, to punish, to beat him, to kill, to destroy, uh, to send them back to the uh, uh, mid ages, Things like that. This is the, uh, the narrative. This narrative will not serve for long, long, long term. Things like that, it's a changeable thing in history. Who can give them a guarantee that the US will stay as a superpower forever, globally speaking? Who can give them that they will stay as a superpower in the region for long term? That's the politics. This is the politics. Here, you know, I'm speaking politics. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Shawan. Um, Catherine, would you like to answer any or all of these questions? Very briefly. Um, you know, I'm a US citizen, uh, an, an American, and so on the question of what is the future of, um, of, of Palestine, I only can say as a human rights attorney that the right of self-determination is enshrined in the UN Charter and it is the very first right listed in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So that is not a question for me to answer, but I would hope that the international community allows Palestinians to answer it for themselves. Um, when it comes to the, the question you asked about conflict, assault, et cetera, what are the terms that we um, could or should be using? Again, just two very brief comments. Um, to the extent that a occupation is recognized under international law as an international armed conflict, and thus the international humanitarian law applicable to an international armed conflict applies, I would use the word conflict, um, but it is a prolonged belligerent occupation. Um, that is the accurate description of what is happening in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and, and Gaza. And what we saw um, in late April and early May of this year, as we have seen um, many times before, too many times before, are attacks on civilians, primarily. Um, this is not a war between, quote, Hamas and Israel. This is a, these tend to be attacks and assaults on civilian populations. So I, I think the correction that I would like to see made is 
who this quote unquote conflict is between. It is most often a, a it is really an attack on civilian populations. So I would take Hamas out of that, even if Hamas maybe who um, is engaging Hamas as part of a Palestinian um, people, but who is engaging in on some level with Israel, it, Israel's response and attack is against the civilian um, population of Palestinians. That's that's really all I have to say on that point. Thank you, Catherine. Artie. Well, thank you very much for the additional questions which I've made note of, and I'll I'll try and address each in order that they were put. So on the question of whether or not one can identify international legal subalternity, ILS, that, that condition in the prohibition on uh, against colonialism and the manner in which this prohibition has evolved within the international legal order such that um, we, international jurists, scholars, practitioners, et cetera, have had to deal with its constituent parts, colonialism's constituent parts, as opposed to the crime as a whole, such as it exists, because it isn't a crime as such. Um, I think there is something there. I think your questioner has something there. And that's the, that, that's the thing is that um, my idea of international legal subalternity, I think, finds a unique expression in an embodiment in the Palestinian people and in the place known as Palestine, but it has application much, much, uh, on a much broader basis and to a much wider group of, of, of folks, um, subjects of the international system really, or non-subjects. And I deal with that slightly in the book. And my, my book is primarily focused on Palestine, but in the introduction, in the, in the conclusion, I raise up a number of examples. Some examples, for instance, the, 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 the classification or the, the um, Groups such as women, refugees, indigenous peoples, um, and, and the law, respectively, human rights law, uh, but also the law on self-determination as it, it, it applies to, to indigenous peoples such as they are as categories in international law. You can see the same theme of international legal subalternity replicated throughout. Even in the crime of, of slavery, you see that there was a time when international law was perfectly allowed the holding in property of, of individuals, of, of people, of persons. And it took a long time for claims to be made to press against that allowance and create prohibitions on slavery. And ironically, it was the use of, if you like, prevailing international legal norms at the time against this hegemonic use of law to keep people in bondage that produced new law. And the same is true, for instance, with the rights of indigenous peoples. You know, the United Nations has a declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples dated from 2007. And if you read that 43 article or 47 article declaration, which is non-binding of the General Assembly, which the GA passed, it's non-binding. Um, it makes reference to the right of indigenous peoples to exercise self-determination. But when you read on, you realize that that self-determination is limited. It is limited to what international lawyers call internal self-determination. That is, as opposed to external self-determination, which is ostensibly enjoyed by the people of Palestine, Canada, the United States, and, other, and others. Internal self-determination where you can exercise limited autonomy, but without violating the territorial integrity or political independence of the larger state that subsumes you or within which you are subsumed, Right? So First Nations in say Canada or the United States can exercise limited autonomy, but may not do so to the, uh, to the extent of basically destroying Canada as a state and destroying the, 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 the statehood, if you like, of the United States. This is, con this is contrasted with the right of peoples to self-determination externally. And all of this to say that I think your question has identified yet another uh, example of where the ILS condition finds finds expression, and I would encourage you to follow that. Indeed, um, I would be interested in looking at that question as, as well. Um, next, somebody had mentioned the ICJ and whether or not there are any continued cases at the ICJ. It's a great question. I, I should have mentioned it earlier. The answer is yes. Um, there's one now uh, 
brought by the state of Palestine, which again, I affirm is a state as a matter of international law, uh, brought by the state of Palestine against the United States of America. It is currently pending before the International Court of Justice. And uh, it is brought uh, under a, what we call a comp comp compromissory clause or a special clause in a treaty. In this case, the treaty is the Vienna Convention on the Law, on Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. And it's a clause that basically says, in the event two state parties disagree with how this convention is to be applied, they can take up their dispute at the International Court of Justice. And the, United, and, and the state of Palestine claims that by the United States' decision under the Trump administration to move its embassy, uh, the US embassy, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, it is violating the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations because even though the Vienna Convention does not mention anything about Palestine, specifically, or any state for that matter, it implies, because it governs uh, diplomatic relations between states, uh, which involve the sending and receiving by states of diplomatic envoys, that implies that one state may not send their diplomatic envoy to another state unless that diplomatic envoy will be situated when they're taking up their position in the sovereign territory of the receiving state. And of course, Palestine's position is that West Jerusalem has yet to be finalized in terms of, a, of its sovereignty and Jerusalem is not certainly the sovereign territory of the state of Israel. This case is now before the ICJ. And the question before the ICJ is now not on its merits, but at the jurisdiction phase. And the jurisdiction phase requires the court to determine whether or not it actually has jurisdiction to hear the matter. And the, the matter before the court is boiled down to one issue, similar to that which was, well, pri one primary issue, similar to that which was before the pretrial chamber at the International Criminal Court, whether or not Palestine is itself a state. Why is this a question? Because as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, the ICJ, only states may appear before it. So Palestine has brought its case. The United States is challenging uh, the propriety of the case brought by Palestine, not on the merits of what Palestine is arguing, but simply on the basis that Palestine itself is not a state. I've assisted with a bit on the case. That's why I know a little bit on, on it. So watch that space. In addition, there are, if you like, discussions and have been discussions for a few years now, um, including um, by, by yours truly, on why the state of Palestine needs to go back to the International Court of Justice for a second advisory opinion of the court, this time focused, and I get into this in, a, in my book, and I'm also, I've also published an article on it, which I'm happy to share with your viewers, this time asking the court one simple question, uh, what are the legal consequences of Israel's continued presence in the occupied Palestinian territory? Uh, that's the short form. And the focus there is to look at one of the issues I raised in my presentation, not at the illegality of the multiple discrete violations by the occupying power of IHL or human rights law, settlements, deportation, confiscation of property, et cetera, not those but to look at the legality of the regime impo imposed by the occupying power on the OPT as a whole. And if that regime is illegal, for instance, because it violates the, the general prohibition on the use of force, it does. For instance, because it violates the right of peoples to self-determination, it does. For instance, because it imposes a, a regime of apartheid on that population and on that space, I do believe it does then the regime itself is illegal. And if the regime is illegal, and if the International Court of Justice is able to determine that it is illegal, then the most important thing that flows from that, both legal and political, is the following, that you can't end that illegal act, the illegal occupation, through negotiation. The law and state responsibility requires that it be ended forthwith, unilaterally, and unconditionally by the occupying power. That matters. It could be a paradigm shift in how the UN has managed the question of Palestine, particularly post-67, that helps the Palestinian people break free from what I call the negotiations condition, which in fact is a red herring. It will ensure, so long as we continue to call for a negotiated resolution between a bad faith occupant and, and a people who are subject to its control and have no power over the occupying power whatsoever, it will subject them to continued subjugation. Um, and, and it really is a red herring.
the negotiations condition. So look for the second or advocate for a second advisory opinion, if you like. See the European Journal of International Law some months ago where I wrote about that there. Language, the politics of language. Well, I can't say much about that. I realize and do appreciate very much now, and increasingly so, people are beginning to say, look, this isn't a conflict as such. In fact, it is a settler colonial endeavor, and there is a victim, that is those who are being colonized, their territory is being colonized and all of that, and there is a perpetrator, uh, the settler colonial power, et cetera. I get all of that, and I quite agree with that frame from an anthropological, historical, even political standpoint. At the same time, and this is one of the problems and critiques of international lawyers, I do understand why Katie would take the view that, uh, say, if you're looking at the OPT uh, as an occupied territory, which requires that you have in place an international armed conflict, which is itself a term of art in international law, humanitarian law, that you must necessarily use the term conflict. To my mind, I think those terms are interchangeable and can be depending on the context. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and I won't say much more. And last but not least, the last question, obstacles and advantages to the one state or two state solution. I very much appreciate the question. And it's one that often is put to me. Um, I think the first place to start is to acknowledge that the only reason why that question is now in front of us is because of the actions of, of Israel. So successful in their colonization of historical Palestine they have been, that, that those actions are causing us to try and square the circle of how the international community and its framework have framed the problem of Palestine since 1947. And so um, I can see why we would have to necessarily look at this question. I mean, uh, it, you know, in fact, what Shahwan has described earlier is true. There's only one real sovereign, not in the legal art, term of art sense. Israel can never be sovereign in the occupied territory. It can't as a matter of law. It has no legitimate sovereign claim there as a matter of law. But in fact, they are the only power who's exercising any measure of real sovereignty across the whole territory from river to sea. So is this a one state solution? And is this a one state situation? And I think most people would say, in fact, it is. But does that necessarily mean that we cannot, if you like, maintain the legal framework, which is not a material one, it's a discursive one, the legal framework of the two state frame, if you like, in this space? And are there any benefits to doing so and detriments to removing it? Yes, there are benefits, and yes, there are serious detriments to doing so. So let me begin with the benefits. I'd mentioned some of them earlier. The state of Palestine exists as a matter of public international law. There are debates on this, but the vast majority of states on planet Earth recognize the state of Palestine, some 70% of them. So uh, on a constitutive theory of statehood, that test is satisfied. If you look at the declarative theory of statehood, which I do in some of my other writings, the Montevideo Convention of 1933, Palestine satisfies, arguably, but I believe it satisfies all the requirements of statehood. And these things are important because the consequences of establishing Palestine's statehood is that it can make greater use of multilateral mechanisms, including at the International Court of Justice, um, and elsewhere, like the ICC and so forth. So it's an important tool, if you like, not an end to justice, but a tool towards it that must not, under any circumstances, be relinquished, in my respectful view. Because that brings me to the, to the if you like, uh, detriments of doing so. If you remove the two-state frame, um, I'm no Zionist, but you remove the idea of the legitimacy, if you like, of Jewish statehood. And so there will be a great, uh, uh, if you like, rejection of that by members of the Israeli Jewish community. And that's one thing that I think we all must necessarily acknowledge. But more important than that, particularly from the Palestinian standpoint, and it was discussed slightly by Shawan, if you do so, then you nest and adopt the one state framework and adjust that national discourse towards that end, then you necessarily will have to face questions on, along the following lines. What of the gains, serious gains, legal and political that have been made by the national Palestinian movement since 1964 in the multilateral international political and legal order? Those are as follows. The juridical status of the people of Palestine. They're not merely a people culturally or historically, but they're a juridical people. And the consequences of being a juridical people 
are that you enjoy the next thing, self-determination and the right to self-determination, which is a peremptory norm of public international law, derogation from which is not permitted. If you are not permitted to violate a people's right to exercise external self-determination, then that right, even though it is being impeded and with reckless abandon since 1967, is something that if you release and let go in favor of a one state claim, without any guarantee that that letting go will be met, reciprocated by the occupying power, handing you your freedom, then I would suggest to you that that is folly. Um, and third, that the third gain that would need to be relinquished is the, the um, status of the occupied Palestinian territory as indeed occupied. Under the principles of the law of belligerent occupation, an occupying power cannot be sovereign in occupied territory. And the moment you say, all right, Israel, take the keys. This is no longer occupied territory. You actually hand Israel exactly what it's been working for for the past 54 years. Um, an acquiescence in their claim to sovereignty by the people who ostensibly hold sovereignty, that is the Palestinian people, exclusively to the exclusion of the whole of the international community in the self-determination unit of the Palestinian people being the OPT without any promise at all that the occupying power will reciprocate and grant you your rights, human rights, dignity, freedom in this one state. So the stakes are very, very high and need to be worked through very carefully politically and legally, but I suggest that your, your questioner needs to consider those facts. Thank you, RD. Um, and that brings us to the end of our half day event on um, Israel Palestine, where is the UN? And I want to thank all of the participants uh, in this panel, uh, Shalan Jabarin, uh, Catherine Gallagher, and RD Imsis, and from our first panel, of course, Raji Sarani, Shahad Bashara and Michael Link. This was a very narrow uh, title, but I thought a very relevant, relevant peg on which to hang a wider discussion which we've had today on the situation in Israel-Palestine and the role of international law and multilateral agencies. It seems clear that until there's a resolution that provides equal rights, justice and self-determination for Palestinians, then we'll continue to see the events and situations that we've described here today. But what I find really heartening from the two panels, and which is really the main reason I approach the speakers that you've heard here today, is that there are mechanisms and structures in place, particularly we heard today the new uh, Human Rights Council's Commission of Inquiry, and of course the forthcoming ICC investigation. Um, and there are people who are trying to use these uh, mechanisms, including activists and lawyers, both uh, locally and uh, at the international level. So if you enjoyed today's events, please go to the HDRI's webpage and sign up to hear about our future ones, and you can follow us on Twitter. This event was recorded and will soon be up on social media. Uh, please do look out for it and share it with your friends and colleagues. Thanks again to the speakers for today and for the audience participation. Your questions were really great in pushing along the discussion, and I wish you all a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for having us.